Thank you. 
Good morning. Good morning. Muy buenos días. Uh, let us start our service by joining together in song. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing our church hymn. this church. May the quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. Que el amor sea la doctrina de esta iglesia, la búsqueda de la verdad su sacramento, y el servicio su oración. Vivir juntos en paz, buscar la verdad con libertad y ayudarnos mutuamente en comunidad. A eso aspiramos. You can be seated. Today we honor many important occasions. Yesterday was Human Rights Day. Tomorrow is the feast day for the Virgen de Guadalupe. As such, we celebrate the wonder of the season, the joy of devotion, the miracle of our lives, and the precious and most holy desire for everyone to be treated with dignity and love. Chalice lighting today was written by Reverend Scott Taylor. Look, friends, to the sky, to the stars that dance like fireworks overhead, this tiny globe on which we travel. Look to the horizon, the tree line, the expanse of wide open fields, to this living, breathing earth that makes our living and breathing possible. Look at the faces that surround you and notice what a wonder it is that we don't have to walk this world alone. All of it is a miracle. All of it deserves our awe. May this light we kindle and this time we share illuminate the astonishing preciousness of it all. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Omega Burkhart. I'm so glad that you are here today with us at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Diego. My pronouns are she, they, y ella en español. A very special welcome to you if you're joining us for the first time. A welcome to those of you joining us from home. If today is your first time, we invite you to fill out a card that you can find in your order of service. Nuestra comunidad es una congregación vital, diversa, multigeneracional y sin fronteras, cuya misión es crear comunidad, fomentar el crecimiento espiritual y vivir, vivir nuestros valores para ayudar a sanar el mundo. We are a congregation made up of people of different racialized identities and cultures, people of various sexual orientations and gender identities, and people with a variety of physical and mental abilities. Somos creadores de comunidad y compasión, y aunque a veces nos quedamos cortos, estamos comprometidos a dar una bienvenida a todos. In a spirit of reverence, 
We acknowledge that we gather this morning to reflect and sing and learn and converse on the stolen land of the Kumeyaay, who continue to pray and sing and gather and live throughout their territories. As we journey together, may we hold the Kumeyaay in our hearts and in our minds. At this moment, we would like to pause to honor the life of a dearly beloved member of this community, Bobby Beer. Bobby, age 82, passed away after three years in a nursing home being cared for following a fall and multiple long-term illnesses. She joined the church in 1974 and became active in the young adult group, the Aquarians. She was also a member of the Mandala dance group that performed periodically at church services. She wrote cards to parishioners who were sick or who experienced loss on behalf of the Practical Care Network. She was grateful to those who provided rides to church and supported her through difficult periods in her life. Her life centered around this community. We light this candle in Bobby's honor and memory, and to mark the weightiness of this loss, we will extinguish the flame of our chalice, the symbol of our gathered community, because our company has been diminished by her loss. And yet, the light of this community continues, and Bobby's spirit lives on in the many among us here who loved her and will remember her. So from her candle, we will relight our chalice. This community of memory and hope shines on, and Bobby lives among us in the heart's long journey. And I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join me in singing People Look East. The words are on the screen or in the hymnal number 226. Keep the watch. 
And as we continue to look east for the light to return in this time of darkness and today of cold, we light three candles on our Advent wreath as we count down the weeks until Christmas. And now I invite any children or youth who would like to join me up on the steps for a time for all ages. Good morning. Sure. <laughs> good morning, good morning. So in today's service, we're thinking a little bit, especially in our sermon, about social justice. And for the time for all ages today, I picked a book called My Voice is a Trumpet. But before we hear about how our voice is a trumpet, I thought it might be fun to hear an actual trumpet. So I'm going to hand it over to Marshall to talk about the trumpet. Thanks, Tony. Actually, I think, I think I'll come and sit right. Can you all see me if I sit right here? So this is a trumpet. It's kind of a squished trumpet. Most trumpets are longer. This is called a pocket trumpet. And the way that it works is you put your lips together and you kind of blow air really quickly into the, into the trumpet. And the air passes through all the pipes. And then by pushing down these buttons, they're called valves. By pushing down these valves, you can change the pitch of the trumpet. You can change the notes that you're going to play. So I thought I'd demonstrate a little bit for you if that's all right. Uh, and you can hear the trumpet and then we'll read our story. Nice, thank you. So what you might have noticed about the trumpet, it, it, is, it is kind of hard to miss, isn't it? It's, a, it's very small, but for something so small, it makes a pretty loud sound, right? Yeah, bigger ones would make a bigger sound, and if you blow harder, it would make a bigger sound. But even played softly, trumpets are pretty present. They're hard to miss that sound. And so I think our book is going to tell us how we can make our voices like that, so when we speak up, our voices are loud and clear and able to be heard, especially when we're speaking up for justice. And so let's take a look at our book. My Voice is a Trumpet by Jimmy Allen, illustrated by Kathy Ann Johnson. Some have a voice as tall as a tree, loud and proud and sways in the breeze. Some have a voice as small as a bee, soft and sweet like kisses of honey. Some have a voice that's patient and wise, with lessons of life told through sparkling eyes. Some have a voice sunny and bright, a voice that can echo and light up the night. There's a voice that is silent, but still can be heard 
with hands that move to speak every word. Then there's the voice that roars like a lion, a big voice that tells you, always keep trying. We all have voices, voices to hear. My voice is a trumpet, strong and clear. My voice will be loud when I'm not sure I know to wonder, to learn, to ask as I go. I will learn to speak up, to show I am strong, to stand up for what's right and to know what feels wrong. My voice is a rainbow after the storm, loving, comforting, safe and warm. I'll use my voice to find joy in others, reminding us all we're siblings, sisters and brothers. I'll say no to hate by using this voice and always choose love, a magical choice. Voices are powerful and together they're strong, like the musical notes of a beautiful song. How will you use your voice? The end. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Oh, the end is not part of the book? Yeah, I added that so they would know that the video is over. <laughs> so, but you're right. The end is not part of the book. And hopefully it doesn't end because I think the book challenges you to use your voice to speak out for what you believe in. That's and what, that Oh, that's why I don't say the end. So I take back the end. <laughs> it's not over. <laughs> to be continued. Is that better? Oh, perfect. Okay. So now I, will ho I hope you will help me use your voice to lead the congregation in our affirmation. If you could stand up with me and use our voices and hands. We'll say it first in English and then in Spanish. We are Unitarian Universalists, a people of open minds, loving hearts, and welcoming hands. Somos Unitarios Universalistas, personas de mentes abiertas, corazones amorosos, y manos que dan la bienvenida. And I invite any of the children of youth who'd like to join us outside. We'll walk quickly to our places for religious education. Also, if you're looking for the youngest group, parents, after the, after the service, they will be in the common room today because they're going to be using the sink. I must admit, had you asked me, is there such a thing as a pocket trumpet? I probably would have said no, but that might be the cutest trumpet I've ever seen. <laughs> would you like to share a joy or a concern, large or small, this morning? If so, we invite you to speak with one of our trained lay ministers after the service. Susan Oliver is here with us and will be wearing a colorful scarf outside on the patio after the service. We also invite you this morning to speak with a member of San Diegans for Gun Violence Prevention who will be outside after the service with our SJET team. We are supporting their work in the region and we are looking for ways to collaborate with them, including participating in a vigil that will be held next Saturday at St. Paul's on 6th Street to honor the victims of gun violence. If you would like more information, you can see one of our SJET members or the uh, person I believe Carol is here from the organization can answer those questions for you. If you would like to hear more about another organization doing great work in the world, Code Pink is uh, an organization founded by women, Women for Peace, founded by Medea Benjamin. We are sponsoring and hosting and inviting you to a book discussion tomorrow evening right here in the Meeting House with Medea. She will be talking about her most recent book called War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. If you'd like more information about that event, you can find it in this week's window. And I believe there was an article also written about it in First Words this past month. Also, you will hear more in a few minutes about our virtual pulpit guest today, Bruce Knox. You're invited to chat with him on Zoom after the service today. We will have an area set up in Bard Hall where you can go with Reverend Justine, who will be facilitating that conversation. If you're heading home, you can find the Zoom link available in the window and online. 
and you can connect from there if you would prefer. This congregation aspires to live into our principles by supporting, engaging with, and forming relationships with local organizations that are working to support growth, save lives, and honor human dignity. And we are so glad that we're supporting a very local group this month, which is our food pantry that operates out of the South Bay campus. The food pantry distributes food and diapers on Saturday and Sunday morning, and the money that you are donating through your generosity offering today is going directly to holiday food for our guests and clients. We are so glad to be able to support this important, important work. You may donate here in person in the dip jars if you'd like. Uh, there are also baskets there. If you'd like some assistance, please raise your hand. If you are uh, at home and you would rather donate that way, you can always go to our website, firstuusandiego.org. And thank you, como siempre, muchísimas gracias por su generosidad. Thank you, as always, for your generosity. Now, while we have our generosity moment and, and all of you are lining up, all of you are lining up <laughs> to donate this morning, instead of offering music, we are going to play an offering meditation. This was prepared by Tony a few uh, weeks ago. Tony and I went down to the food pantry and recorded the sounds of a Saturday morning at the food pantry. So, you are invited to sit back <clears throat> after you line up for the generosity offering. You are invited to sit down and close your eyes. There are no images, just some subtitles to help you. And listen to the joy and the energy and the vitality of a typical Saturday morning. And I'm looking out here, I see some of you who volunteer regularly on Saturday mornings. You may recognize yourself and your voice in this video. Thank you, gracias, siempre.
Hoy va a ser un poco diferente. Todo un poco, because today's going to be just a little different. When you come back, we, there will be a big trailer truck with many boxes in it. O sea, va a haber una, un camión al lado ahí. Um, de ahí vamos a distribuir cajas de 20 libras cada caja. Oh, Thank you, amigo. Oh, grabando sonido para comercial. Good. Muy bueno. Thank you. Backy, 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 back. Oh, I say, what is this? Okay, gracias. Okay, gracias. Buenos días, mi doñita. ¿Cuánta su amiga? Dos. A ver, hágame el campito ahí porque también empezaron a trabajar, ¿sí? Ah, vale, buenito, para que no le pase pan. Thank you for journeying with us to the food pantry. Our reading this morning, the preamble to the UN Charter. We, the people of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and nations, large and small, to promote progress and better standards of life in larger freedom, and for these ends to practice tolerance and to live together in peace as good neighbors, to unite our strength to maintain international peace and security, to ensure that armed force shall not be used save in the common interest to employ international machinery in the promotion of the economic and social advancement of all people, have resolved to combine our efforts to accomplish these aims. So in our worship planning, we follow a calendar of monthly themes, which sometimes play very prominently in our services and sometimes a little less so, depending on what's going on. But the theme for the month of December is wonder. And I know this song. It's a Paul Simon song. You might know it too. These are the days of miracle and wonder. 
I thought of this song, and it tells a sort of hard story. It's a story about a war-torn area, uh, and it just felt very appropriate to sing it this morning. Um, so I hope you find it meaningful. The words will be up on the screen. Uh, maybe you'll recognize it. It was a slow day, and the sun was beating on the soldiers by the side of the road. There was a bright light, a shattering of shop windows, the bomb in the baby carriage was wired to the radio. These are the days of miracle and wonder. This is the long distance call. The way the camera follows us in slow-mo, the way we look to us all. The way we look to a distant constellation that's dying in a corner of the sky. These are the days of miracle and wonder and don't cry, baby, don't cry, don't cry. It was a dry wind and it swept across the desert and swirled into a circle of birth. And the dead sand falling on the children, the mothers and the fathers and the automatic earth. And I believe these are the days of miracle and wonder. This is the long distance call. The way the camera follows us in slow-mo. The way we look to us all. The way we look to a distant constellation that's dying in a corner of the sky. These are the days of miracle and wonder and don't cry, baby, don't cry, don't cry. It's a turnaround jump shot, it's everybody jump start, it's every generation throws a hero up the pop charts. Medicine is magical and magical is art. Think of the boy in the bubble and the baby with the baboon heart. These are the days of lasers in the jungle, lasers in the jungle somewhere. Staccato signals of constant information, a loose affiliation of millionaires and billionaires and baby. These are the days of miracle and wonder. This is a long distance call. The way the camera follows us in slow-mo The way we look to us all, oh yeah The way we look to a distant constellation That's dying in a corner of the sky These are the days of miracle and wonder And don't cry, baby, don't cry Don't cry, don't cry My name is Everardo Aguilar. I am your church board of trustees vice president. My pronouns are he, him, in Espanol, él. And I am also partly your UN at, UU at UN envoy. In that capacity, I'm going to be introducing Bruce Nuts. But before I do, um, I would like to um, give this opportunity to present to you uh, the two people who are replacing me as envoy as liaison to the UU, UU at UN office. Um, the envoy is charged with uh, promoting, not only promoting the goals of the UN within our individual UU congregations and supporting the, our sixth principle of building uh, world community, but also 
uh, we are educating uh, our communities about the UN and what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, and so that the, after 30 years of now passing the torch to, about time, don't you think, uh, to Rosalba Kianfi Camfi and um, Abby Mercado, Mercado, if you are here, please stand. Rosalba, there you go. Applause, applause, applause. So I will still be around in 2023 to help them with transition, but they will eventually take over as envoy to this congregation at, with the UU at UN office. And I'm very happy and proud to pass this responsibility onto these two very capable individuals. So another round of applause for them, please. Our guest speaker this morning is Bruce Knotts. Bruce has many accomplishments to his name, but one of the things he is not very good at is retiring. <laughs> Neither am I. After about 20 years of working in the Foreign Service with the diplomatic assignments in Greece, Zambia, India, Pakistan, Kenya, Sudan, Cote d'Ivoire, and the Gambia, Bruce retired from the Foreign Service in 2007 and began directing the Unitarian Universalist United Nations Office, now known as EU at the UN, in 2008. And I have to say, when he took over, it really brought that organization up to, to a whole different level. And I, I, I was really appreciative of all the work he and his staff did to support us uh, envoys throughout our respective congregations. So I just want to throw in that shout out. Bruce founded faith-based advocacy for sexual orientation and gender identity human rights at the United Nations continues to advocate for the rights of women, indigenous peoples, and for sustainable development in moral terms of faith and values. Bruce is co-chair of, of the UN NGO, NGO stands for Non-Governmental Organization, uh, Committee on Human Rights, and the chair of the NGO Committee on Disarmament, Peace, and Security, a member of steering committee of the NGO United Nations Security Council Working Group. Bruce retired from the UU United Nations office just a few months ago on September 30th, 2022, and now serves, again, not so good at retirement, uh, as Director of International Engagement and Community, at Community Church in New, York, in New York. Born and raised in Southern California, Bruce now lives in New York City with his husband Isaac, whom he married in 2006 in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. We will hear and watch Bruce's sermon online and Bruce will be available live on Zoom for a discussion beginning at 11.30 Pacific time right here in Bard Hall. You can join us here on campus in Bard Hall or you can um, click in online uh, through our Zoom connection. So I present to you Bruce Knotts. Dear sisters and brothers in faith, I'm delighted to be with you here at the First Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Diego. I so very much admire the work you do to create the beloved community. Our last spring seminar in April this year was on climate force displacement. Our keynote speakers were the Pacific Island students fighting climate change. Two of these students are here at the United Nations now and working with the mission of Vanuatu to the UN. Vanuatu is one of 15 Pacific Island states threatened by rising sea levels caused by climate change. The indigenous peoples of these islands have a profound connection to their land where they and their ancestors have lived. Vanuatu has been called the world's densest linguistic landscape. There are 145 languages spoken by fewer than 300,000 people. Each linguistic group has its own culture and connection to the land where they live and where their ancestors are buried. All this is to say that these people are not easily moved to Australia or the United States. Such displacement is a profound cultural injury. Island states in the Pacific preserve fresh water in pools and wells. This water is what they drink and what they use to grow the food they eat. 
With sea levels rising, the salt water inundates the freshwater reserves, contaminating the freshwater, making it impossible to drink or use for agriculture. We see the effects of climate force displacement around the world and in our own country. I'm from California, like many of you. And my husband and I joined other family members to distribute the ashes of my cousin Carol's husband, Glenn, at Trinity Lake in Northern California. As we drove from San Francisco to Trinity Lake, we saw thousands of acres of destroyed by forest fires caused by climate change. <coughs> Trinity Lake has lost much of its water, as have other lakes and rivers in the West due to climate change. There have been 8,100 recorded forest fires in California destroying 4.5 million acres of land, including farmland and residential areas in 2020 alone. People have lost their homes and livelihoods, which insurance has failed to recompense. This displacement in California and in the Pacific Islands is taking place everywhere in the world. Floods in British Columbia, Canada, homes washed away in Germany. And we haven't touched the part of the globe where the poorest and most vulnerable people live and are affected by climate change. These climate events force people to leave their land where they live and seek refuge elsewhere. Sometimes that elsewhere is within their home country, but with increasing frequency, these catastrophic climate events cause people to seek refuge in another country. Current refugee and migration law comes from the experience of the Second World War. You need to de demonstrate a well-founded fear of persecution by your government due to your ethnicity, politics, religion, or other factors. This kind of persecution was what resulted in um, millions of Jews and others being killed in Germany and millions of people fled the oppression of war and uh, uh, political oppression. Refugee and migration law has not been updated to consider climate change. Furthermore, there is no political appetite to expand the circumstances under which people can claim refugee status. However, regardless of the inadequacies of the law, people must move. My own experience with refugees is that people move mostly out of concern for their children. What parent can watch their children suffer and do nothing? Parents who see their children starving, in danger, without hope for a decent life, will do whatever they can to get their children to a safe place where they can hope for a safe and dignified life. What to do? We must fight climate change. Recently, the UN General Assembly overwhelmingly voted to make a safe environment a human right. We also expect the Vanuatu resolution to pass, which will call on the International Court of Justice to provide an advisory opinion on the legal obligation of nations to ensure a safe environment for everyone everywhere. Addressing climate change is no longer optional. It's mandatory. It is urgent that we preserve our forests, especially the Amazon forest in Brazil. Forests are our best hope of absorbing carbon emissions which cause climate change. The United Nations has made it clear that to survive, more of the Earth's surface needs to be covered by forests and far less to be devoted to industrial animal agriculture. That means we need to change what we eat. In 2011, the UUA enacted the Ethical Eating and Food Environment Justice Statement of Conscience. This statement calls on us to eat a plant-based diet as much as possible and eat food that is locally grown. The Buddhist Suchi Foundation took notice and they promote the Ethical Eating Day every January 11, 111. Since January 11, 2019, the Buddhist Suchi Foundation has gathered 1,229,988 pledges to eat ethically in order to protect the environment. So while the Buddhist Tsuchi Foundation promotes the UUA ethical eating around the world based on our 2011 statement of conscience, UUs are largely oblivious to our own statement of conscience on ethical eating. I'm a proud Unitarian Universalist and I'm also a proud 
follower of Dhamma Master Chen Yen, and I'm a Buddhist Tsuchi Foundation Commissioner. So we need to fight climate change by every means at our disposal, beginning, beginning with our own eating habits. Secondly, we need to share what we have. We need to be more generous and giving. We need to open our door to our borders for those seeking refuge from disastrous conditions caused by the polluting, polluting industrialized nations of the world. We need to embrace the concept of loss and damage. When a country like Pakistan is inundated by flooding that covers one third of the country, destroying homes and precious agricultural land, we need to use our wealth to compensate for the loss and damage our industrial wealth has caused around the world. We have a serious labor shortage in the United States and elsewhere. We have jobs and we can accommodate more migrants who are eager to work hard to have a safe place for them and their families to live. Moving on from climate force displacement, let me touch on the global political situation. I have long observed that we need to dismantle many hierarchies, white supremacy, religious nationalism, English language supremacy, patriarchy, and much more. Patriarchy oppresses us all. It is only by dismantling patriarchy that we can breathe free. I have retired from my position at the UUA, giving me time and opportunity to focus my advocacy on the issues of concerns to me. I am currently the Director of International Engagement at the Community Church of New York, where in 1962, the Unitarian Universalist Office of the United Nations began its 60-year history of advocating UU values at the United Nations. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to recall three initiatives at the UN that I feel most significant over the past years. I hope discussing how these achievements were accomplished might prove as a guide as to what we need to do going forward in globalizing our advocacy to counter the very aggressive and well-resourced forces of autocratic religious nationalism, which seeks to destroy human rights, democracy, diversity, and inclusion. These are the folks that make it a crime to say gay, that ban books that, and won't allow a discussion of slavery and what was done to the indigenous peoples around the world because telling the truth might disturb, disturb some bigot's sense of superiority. I began my time at the UU at UN by meeting Reverend Bill Sinkford in Boston. I said, I hope you don't mind, but I intend to follow a very aggressive LGBTIQ plus program at the UN. Bill said, if you don't follow such a program, then I will mind. I felt the wind in my sails. It's that kind of support from the top that empowers dedication and concerted action. The UN was planning a conference in Paris, this is 2008, to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The UN planned to discuss the human rights of just about everybody. Men, women, Dalits in India, Roma in Europe, everybody except LGBTIQ plus people. I raised my hand and asked, what about the human rights of LGBTIQ plus people? I was told, we'll take that under advisement. I kept asking the question week after week and I recruited allies. Finally, I was given the first ever workshop on LGBTIQ plus issues at any con conference like this one that we were planning in Paris. My workshop in Paris was well attended, including by a Swedish diplomat who told me that the European Union planned to present a draft resolution at the UN General Assembly calling for the end of violence and discrimination against people based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. Later, I was invited to speak at a much larger breakout session by Sister Joan Kirby, who was a Catholic and a Buddhist nun. After that speech, a Catholic Monsignor told me that he was gay and supported everything I was doing. I was a bit surprised. When I returned to New York, I worked with many others at the Norwegian mission to the UN to ensure the UN General Assembly draft resolution would succeed. 
It did. And I can't thank the Norwegian government enough for the work they do on climate justice and on LGBT rights and on all aspects of human rights. They basically fund the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the great work that they do. And we actually gave them an award at the Arlington Unitarian Universalist Church in the name of the Unitarian Universalist Office at the United Nations. In 2015, I got a call from one of the lawyers representing the family of Tamir Rice. You remember Tamir was a 12-year-old boy playing alone in a park with a toy gun. Timothy Lohman, a white police officer, drove up to Tamir and shot and killed the boy with no warning. The lawyer wanted to know if we could host an event at the UN to highlight this police brutality. I said, of course. I mentioned that I um, expected the event would, might get about 50 people. Then another lawyer called and he said he knew Harry Belafonte. I said, oh, well, if you know Harry Belafonte, we're gonna have a much bigger event. It was. 500 people were in the audience. The event was live webcast worldwide on UN Web TV and you can still see it on by going to UN Web TV and looking for um, stopping the um, silence on uh, systemic racism. I called Harry Belafonte UN royalty and Belafonte thanked me for my warm, warm embrace. He was magnificent. Alicia Garza, Black Lives Matter, was also a featured speaker, the High Commissioner for Human Rights and a host of other luminaries spoke. We launched the UN Decade of People of African Descent. This was not an easy event to stage. We got pushback from the American mission to the UN who feared we were too critical of the United States. The UN didn't have the money to send a car to pick up Harry Belafonte and his wife, both of advanced age, so I paid for the car service. In the end, the event was an enormous success, and the UN Decade of People of African Descent at the UN continues and will continue until 2025. As a segue to this event, Community Church of New York, where I am the Director of International Engagement and had a large part to, with this event. We hosted an event on December 5th, on Monday, that has the family of George Floyd and many other families of people that have been killed, innocent people killed, unarmed people killed by police with no consequences to the police officers. And we intend to continue this advocacy to end police violence and to have police accountability at, from community church and at the United Nations. We had UN speakers at this event, including Craig Machaber, who is with the High Commissioner's Office of, for Human Rights, and also Hawa Diallo, who is with the UN Department of Global Communications and many, many more speakers. We will continue this work with Community Church in the lead uh, for this kind of advocacy. Finally, I did what I could to help Taiwan become the only nation in Asia to enact legal recognition of same-sex marriage. I began as the chair of the Department of Public Information, DPI Executive Committee, which represented 2,000 NGOs at the UN affiliated with DPI which has changed its name now to the Department of Global Communications. I was invited to speak at a huge event, uh, event sponsored by the World League of Freedom and Democracy. I went with my husband, and together we met with the President of the Republic of China, Taiwan, and I advocated for same-sex marriage in my speech and in my conversations with the President, Foreign Minister, and many others in Taiwan. I talked with LGBTIQ activists in Taiwan, I also spoke with Master Chen Yen, Dharma Master of the Buddhist Suji Foundation. She made it clear that she wanted to stay out of politics and asked me not to say that she was either for or against same-sex marriage. I agreed. But I said, can I tell people that you and your entire Buddhist Suji Foundation have been gracious and kind to both me and my husband? She said, yes, and I did. I also told people that actions speak louder than words. Over the course of years, I met the members of the National Assembly, and I met with the clergy that were for, against, and neutral about same-sex marriage. 
The Presbyterian Church of Taiwan, which is mostly very conservative, forced a referendum on the same-sex marriage issue, which resulted in a small majority voting against same-sex marriage. There were demonstrations against me and my husband. People shouted, we are not guinea pigs, don't experiment on us. I gave a speech which was instantly became front page news in all the major publications. I said, you can't vote on people's human rights. The majority will always vote against the minority. According to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we are all born free and equal in dignity and rights, and those rights can't be voted away by any majority. Later, when the National Assembly debated the same-sex marriage issue, many referred to the results of the national referendum on same-sex marriage. Others quoted me and said, you can't vote away the rights of the minority. The motion passed, and Taiwan is the only nation in Asia that has same-sex marriage. To learn more about this, just Google Bruce Knotts, Taiwan, same-sex marriage in the same line, and you'll see the many, many articles in the Taiwanese press on this story. Charlie Clemens, former head of the UU Service Committee, said, Bruce, you were the right person at the right place at the right time. That's my story. In every example above, I do what I do. I see an opportunity and see it when uh, when it happens to seize it when it happens to appear. I network, build support, and do my best to preserve with patience, persistence, and professionalism. Some say, "Well, if you have this ability, help the Uyghurs and the Rohingya," and I do. And I advocate for much more, like the important issue of nuclear disarmament. However, if the time isn't right and I'm not the right person in the right place at the right time, I'm just an advocate doing my best. However, if you happen to be the right person at the right place at the right time, there is an opportunity for you to accomplish advancements of lasting importance. Be alert to those opportunities and to make a difference. Even when the time is not right, staying engaged and be ready for your time when it comes to make history. Together, we can change the world for the better. I will re never retire from this work. Leaving the UUA has freed me to do what I do best when the opportunity presents itself. No one person can ever do this work alone. We all need allies, help, advisors, and mentors. Let's do that for each other as we work together to create the beloved community. Amen and blessings to you all. To, it's my pleasure to welcome up Valerie Jaquist to lead us in our closing hymn. Please rise in body and spirit and sing this hymn with us. We would be one.
Valerie, you may be seated. A final blessing for us this morning, this day of wonder, this day of celebration of human rights. May we go from this place today with a renewed commitment to love everyone, not just, not just practicing tolerance, yes, but also to love them and to celebrate them, to honor their lives by living in holy peace with one another. Amen. Bendita sea. May it be so. Thank you.